by popular request. Yes, it's time, and we have um, quorum. There are two sessions of the Finance Committee meeting today to deal with six papers on the agenda. When the first session of the meeting comes to a close, we will take a break of ten minutes. The second session will start at five past uh, at ten past five. If I may remind members, if uh, there are direct or indirect political interest involved in any of the items considered today, uh, members, please, uh, in accordance with uh, Rule 83A of the Rules of Procedure, uh, disclose the relevant interest and its nature before you speak on the relevant items. I may also remind members that um, in accordance with Rule 84 of the Rules of Procedure, there are requirements in relation to voting where there's a direct pecuniary interest. Now, item FCR 2013-1435. This item invites member to endorse the two proposals considered at the establishment of, establishment of committee meeting on the 13th of November 2013. That is a EC paper number five and six. Some members have asked uh, that uh, there be separate voting on the two papers. So the first item for separate voting, EC 2013-14-5. This uh, paper proposes that the retention of the three supernumerary posts in the Civil Engineering and Development Department for a period of five years from the 1st of April 2014. One government engineer, one government architect, uh, and, and architect, and uh, one and two chief engineers. This is uh, for uh, continuing taking forward the Kaitak development and the Len Tang Hong Yun Wai Boundary Control Point project. Um, attending meeting to answer members' questions. We have Mr. Liu Chen Seng, Principal Assistant Secretary for Development Works 2, Mr. Hon Chi Kang, Director of Civil Engineering and Department, Mr. Ip Kui Hang, Deputy Head of Civil Engineering Office, and Mrs. Um, Lee Kwan Siu Kun, Head of Kaitech Office under the Civil Engineering and Dep Development Department. Members, any questions, please? Please press the uh, Request to Speak button if you wish to speak. Yes, that's one. Mr. Albert Chen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was the one who proposed a separate voting on this item. The main reason is that, uh, first, I must clarify that uh, I'm not questioning the uh, incompetence of uh, the uh, staff working in this office. I'm saying that uh, the organization is imbalanced and unreasonable. I pointed out at the ESC meeting. There is an established um, system for coordinating works projects. Now, in the past, we had the development office, district development office, and there's an established uh, system and procedure, an established um, staff um, thing arrangement. It's not that because there's a specific project or because of the uh, request of a particular director of bureau or, uh, or the chief secretary, whatever, then there would be a special establishment. Now, um, in those days, um, there was this uh, arrangement of supernumerary post. It was um, unusual, but because the people we wanted um, works to start soon at Kaitech, and there were various types of projects there, the cruise terminal and the um, um, sports complex that I'm against, there's also district cooling system, etc., etc. Kaitech was uh, branded as um, site with the, with perfect town planning. Now it's been many years; the cruise terminal has been completed. Now you want to turn these supernumerary posts into permanent posts is really unacceptable. What about? Um, Northeast New Territories. Isn't there a need for uh, a lot of planning? There's a Lentong uh, um, the, um, uh, boundary control point, and there's Kutong, and there's Hongshui Q. What about them? 
Uh, Kai Tech only has a population of 80,000 people. Hong Shui Q, there will be a population of 220,000 people. And then for Tin Shui Wai, we have a population of 300,000 at a time. That's how we did the planning too. Now for Kai Tech uh, project, it was um, uh, under the charge of the Carrie Lam. Now uh, she's the fav uh, the favored one now, so she's given um, a lot of staff, and uh, we want to protect his reputation, so that's why we're keeping the staff. What about the other districts? Um, residents in those other districts, second class citizens, can they be given inferior treatment just because they are in the other districts? So if you look at the uh, coordination and the planning of works projects, and now all of a sudden you are increasing the post here, it's really not fair to the other residents, and also it's not fair to the staff of the CDD. And they have some officers in charge of uh, works projects um, catering for one million people. Is it the case that for uh, Kowloon East office, uh, Kowloon office, the people are less competent, so the Kowloon East office couldn't also take up the coordination of these projects? Well, if we are, f if you're familiar with the organisation or the staffing arrangement for past uh, projects, then you would know this uh, arrangement now is unreasonable, and you could review the previous documents. The government has never asked for so many new po uh, posts. Uh, it's, it's a record high this year. Uh, Marine Department, they won the um, supernumerary post. Uh, housing Department, because of the long-term housing strategy, they want uh, more posts too. So they are now. Uh, so the senior management directorate staff is ballooning, and you're increasing so many directorate posts. I think you have already made your views known. What, what is your question, please? I just want to state my views because not many people have heard it. So I like to put on record for this particular uh, development, I cannot accept it. And for this particular item, I don't think there is, are enough justifications. That's why I've asked for a separate voting on this item. I know I'm going to lose in the vote, but I'd like to put it on record that this is unjust to other staff and the other officers of the CEDD and to other residents of other districts, they are not given the same treatment. It's also not fair to them. Thank you. So it's just a comment. There's no need to give an answer. Well, if they wish, they could answer it. Uh, it's best to ask Carrie Lam to come and ask uh, to answer the question. Now, she's uh, the favorite one now, and so she can um, do whatever she wants, it seems. Well, for the Kitec um, project, it's one of the ten major infrastructure projects. There are over 300 hectares of land, and, and in the vicinity we have Sampo Kong, Kowloon City, Kun Tong. It is important that we have proper connection with these uh, other districts. That's why the connectivity is important. If I may say a few more words. Now, between 2004 and 2006, we uh, carried out um, public engagement exercise for the development of Kitec. We came up with an uh, online zoning plan, um, but it doesn't mean that we've completed the work. Uh, we will only complete the work by 2021. In the process, there's a lot of town, uh, city planning to be done. Uh, how do we achieve our vision? Well, we need our contract office to work actively on these aspects. And then there will be many stages of public engagement. That's why there's need for these two directorate civil servants to do the work. Of course, there is another team of staff uh, helping out, and we have um, increased some of the posts uh, to to. What about um, NT Northeast? What about Hong Shui Q? Hong Shui Q, the population is 220,000. If you're talking about needs, uh, there is a need in every district. There's nothing else to add, right? Is it just because uh, it was uh, first headed by um, Carrie Lam? Well, we will look at whether the establishment is uh, sufficient for every project. We'll do that. Thank you. Next, Mr. Lan Kwok Hong. Now, if you talk about creating posts, and there are unauthorized building works. Well, then uh, the predecessor of Andrew Fong, uh, Stephen Lam, there, there was Stephen Lam, and Tong Chi Wah couldn't um, get things to work. It's not because he's incompetent, but because uh, he is not good at uh, expressing himself. So there was the uh, information coordinator post created. So it's some form of uh, unauthorized building works, if I could put it that way. So you can't really blame Mr. Albert Chen for raising his doubt. Now, Mr. Mlung Singh, 
You are old enough. Do you, do you mean, can you please come to your question, please? Now, Mr. Albert Chan, it's because uh, Carol Lam is uh, going up higher and higher in the uh, hierarchy. So, you know, the amount of uh, horse excrement, you know, there's a saying that uh, uh, because it's growing, so um, the officials become more important. So, I think um, Albert Chan, you know, you, you, you just don't get it. It's so stubborn. If you want to criticize someone, you should criticize Andrew Fong. He's never been in that business. Please don't digress. Please don't digress. And then all of a sudden he calls up himself the White House uh, spokesman. Mr. Lan Kuo Hong, please focus on this item, please. That's just an analogy. You know, it's about drawing analogies and art to draw analogy. Now, Mr. Bachan's left. I think he shouldn't be so stubborn. The, the uh, at least for this item, um, the officers in charge have been involved, so there's some sort of connection. Now, uh, the, the, there's going to be coordination, but I don't quite get it. How come when we have a general, we don't have more soldiers? Don't we need more soldiers or more staff so that the general could lead a bigger team of uh, soldiers? We can't have a general without soldiers. You see, don't think that I'm siding with uh, Mr. Albert Chen. I think Mr. Albert Chen is just too stubborn. When the Andrew Fung case could happen, why should you even be um, chastising this uh, department here? Because in his case, there's no connection whatsoever. Dr. Lloyd Wycock, there's no need to um, be concerned. I'm talking about something that we could all follow or understand. I'm lecturing you here, actually. Wonder you've been um, tested on this Parkinson's disease when you apply for the AO or EO post. Uh, that's the phenomenon in the... Um, uh, in the government, that is, uh, when every um, new boss comes in, he will create more posts and he will spend all the money. And when there's a deficit there next year, he will get more money. Now, I don't know if this is the case here, if this is the Parkinson's uh, or the Parks. It's the, um, it's the same uh, law here uh, that applies. But anyway, if there's this... Um, person who can't really answer questions of the reporters. He's a messed up um, election, and he could still become the inf information coordinator. Albert Chen, where are you? Oh, so you're so stubborn anyway. You just don't know how it works in the government. Please do not digress. Please come back to this item. What is the problem with this item, or what are your questions, rather? Can I ask um, Ms. Um, Elizabeth there and the one next to her. Well, uh, she's leaving soon. Okay, so do you think this is reasonable? The chief executive has um, spent that uh, spent public money and set up a um, um, useless post, and then uh, someone in company could fill the post. This is unusual. If that's how the government works, it's hard for this council to debate uh, issues. Ms. Chair, can you tell us whether this is reasonable? Dep uh, administration, please, Ms. Chair. Any response from you? On behalf of the administration, I would like to say that for the creation of every post and the relevant uh, proposal is um, based on need. Thank you. Next. Now, for someone uh, without the caliber, he feels a certain post is it uh, acceptable. I'm talking about Andrew Fong. You didn't answer my question. Because the post has been created. So if someone is incompetent, can you really fill the post? I think she's answered the question. Next to Mr. Uh, Dr. Lo Wei Kwok. Mr. Chairman, these posts uh, are just about um, the retention of them. These are supernumerary posts, and they just uh, need to be retained. For the engineer post, as a representative of the engineering sector, I do see the need for them to be kept. Now, the Kaitech project is important and complex for the Lentong Hongyun Wai boundary control point um, 
project is also complex and there's need uh, for coordination with various parties including with the mainland. So there is a need uh, for uh, suitable resources and manpower resources. That's why I support this paper. Now, what Mr. Albert Chen said might seem negative, but actually spot a positive message. That is, uh, apart from this uh, project, there are other projects that would need to uh, support. In the past decade or so, the gov SL government hasn't done a uh, proper job in some of the planning uh, projects. For example, expansion of land, uh, development of land, uh, they, they haven't done a proper job. That's why we don't have land for building more homes. So um, land formation development, uh, we need more engineering projects of the sort and we need more um, starving resources too. So if there are such uh, proposals in the future, I will support them. So what uh, Mr. Albert Chan said might seem negative, but actually he's brought out a positive message and I support what he said. Now, my concern, these are supernumerary posts, so you are adding more generals, chief engineers. What about those underneath him? Maybe you don't need to come to the finance committee, but I'm really concerned whether there is enough uh, staffing support beneath the chief engineer. I just met with friends of the um, Civil Engineers Association recently. And um, in that meeting, they mentioned the difficulties they face. They say there are not not enough staff resources, and uh, because um, technically projects are more complex, they need to spend a lot of time to consult um, the districts and Lechko as well. They need to do a lot more coordination work. So perhaps I'll leave some time for the administration to explain uh, how you take forward such tasks. Whether there will be enough support for the civil service team, especially the professional team, and so that the morale could be boosted. Thank you. Who's to answer the question, please? Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for your question. Uh, for the Civil Engineering and Development uh, Department, 10 years ago there were two departments. They've now been merged into uh, to one department. So that's why the Civil Engineering and Development Department came by. At the time, we had an establishment of about 1,800 people. And upon the merger, um, there was a streamlining of the um, staffing establishment. But in the past um, decade, especially recently, um, Dr. Lowe Michael actually pointed to a fact. There's been uh, an increasing demand as a result of uh, various projects uh, for staff. And in the past decade, uh, We've um, had these three supernumerary posts, but for staff underneath, uh, well, actually, there's been an increase. I don't have the exact figure, but uh, we have added a few dozen staff members. Now, um, for the whole department, the um, is the ratio is now three four three. Three means professional staff, thirty percent professional staff, forty percent technical staff, thirty percent general grades. So we've been uh, monitoring the uh, st the structure of uh, the staff structure for the department as the head of the department. I, w I will keep monitoring whether the structure is healthy, and I believe it's healthy. And as I said, I will keep monitoring the work demands on the department. If there is any increase in work demands, then maybe in the light of um, an increased uh, workload, we may need to add to the establishment. Thank you. Members, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you might all recall very well that uh, when there's an economic downturn, the entire civil service team was streamlined. Now, it's true in the past, um, a lot of the uh, work was not done properly, so there's a need to remedy that as soon as possible. Staffing support is an important aspect of it, and our sector takes that very seriously. So um, I will also put on record my concern, and I hope that in future, when it comes to coordination or the increased uh, increase in workload for chief engineers, we must uh, give the the department more support there. Thank you. Uh, can I you? Mr. Wu Chi Wai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Concerning the three supernumerary posts I have no strong views about their retention. However, I'd like to say something about the extension of five years. At the last meeting of the development panel, I already asked why it should be 
so long as five years because many of the works projects would be completed in 2015-16. Will three years be more accurate such that the CEDD colleagues will more accurately assess the situation then? And then there can be further manpower deployment so as to make use of our human resources more efficiently and effectively. I have no idea about the full picture at the moment, but it seems that if the duration is five years, when major works projects are completed, some colleagues would be returned to the normal establishment. So I'd like to know the justification for five years. Why not three years? And what's the difference between three years and five years? May I refer members to Enclosure 5, which may not give the full picture. But in Enclosure 5, it said that for the other existing engineers and senior engineers in the CEDD, we try as far as possible to set out the details in that enclosure. We have one functional sub-office and four divisional officers. And Lian Tang Heng Yun Wai comes under the Works Division's office. And then the other four divisional officers are regional officers covering the four regions. In the next five years, we can see that in so far as works projects under the CEDD, I can only see an increase not a reduction. So in the next uh, five years, there won't be a decrease in the number of works projects such that our colleagues would be less busy. That will not happen. Now, why not three years? Why five years? Now, we're overseeing the Kaitak development project and then the Liantang Heng Yun Wai control point. For the latter, we would like to commission it in 2018. So in the next few years, we'll be very busy. And then even in 2018, it doesn't mean that our work will be completed because final settlement and accounting will have to be done. So we'll have to monitor the prevailing circumstances then. And then for Kaitak, uh, the cruise terminal, PRH estates, and other facilities have been planned. However, Kaitak development is phased and different projects will be completed by 2013, 2016 and 2021. So our colleagues will have to coordinate various works projects and different bureaus and departments have to be coordinated. Hospitals, schools are included in Kaitak and Runway Park, Metropolitan Park, the long promenade, land formation, etc., will have to be done in the residual period of time all the way up to 2021. I think after five years, we'll gauge the actual needs again before we see whether or not this establishment has to be continued. A very quick follow-up question. Director, does it mean that in the next few years, for the major projects like uh, the XRL, Hong Kong, Macau, Zhuhai Bridge, etc., when they are completed, no chief engineers will go back to your normal establishment as part of your human resources. Is that the case, Director? In the next few years, we're still in at the peak of these works projects. So workload will only increase instead of decrease. So unlike what Mr. Wu Chi Wai has imagined, there won't be any redundancy. Mr. James Tan, Mr. Chairman, a very simple question. The government has so many works projects to complete at the moment. So it may be necessary to have additional human resources other than the normal establishment. In recent times, the vetting of uh, drawings has become slower, probably because of a shortage of manpower. 
Well, even if、uh, you have increased the number of civil servants, if you don't have sufficient workers to do the construction work, what will happen? All right, you contract out these projects. The contractors bid for the projects. For the successful bidders, if they cannot、uh, employ sufficient workers, there will still be a problem. Mr. Wu did not raise this, so I'd like to know for the infrastructure projects, if you don't have sufficient workers, what will happen? Have you thought through all these issues? Otherwise, in future, you have so many additional civil service posts. But if you don't have enough workers, what will happen? All right, a labor issue. Thank you, Mr. Tan, for your question. The Development Bureau will oversee the number of projects, the performance of the contractors, the manpower level, etc. In the next few years, indeed, we'll have quite many infrastructure projects. So we encourage more participation on the part of the contractors. For example, we can contemplate the establishment of joint ventures that may help with manpower supply. All right. If no other members would like to ask questions, I'll put EC twenty thirteen fourteen six to the vote. Will those in favour of EC twenty thirteen fourteen five please raise their hands? Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Yes, we'll take a division. Please ring the bell. The division bell will ring for five minutes.
。誒、呃，現在開始表決。誒、呃，我重複提一次啊 ！E C 括弧二零一三至一四括弧五號嘅文件。We'll now take a vote on E C 2013-14-6. Will those in? Yes, members. Members, please press your buttons. Before I declare the voting results, so please check your votes. Yes, please display the voting results. Fifty-one present. Forty-five for, four against, one abstention. I think the majority of the voting members support the proposal. The proposal is endorsed. We now come to the next item on the agenda. That is FCR twenty thirteen fourteen thirty six, which is to. Be discussed together with EC 2013-14-6, which is to be voted upon separately, because that is related to the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Finance Ministers Meeting 2014. So it is proposed that the two items be discussed together. And a vote be taken on them separately. Government Secretariat, Financial Services, and the Treasury Bureau, Financial Services Branch. Members are invited to recommend to Finance Committee the creation of the following supernumerary directorate posts. The creation of one administrative officer, staff grade. B post and a senior principal executive office uh, post for the organisation of the finance ministers meeting FMM of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC in September 2014. As for paper FCR 2013-14-36, members are invited to approve the creation of a new commitment of 63.45 million dollars under Head 148. Government Secretariat, Financial Services, and the Treasury Bureau, Financial Services Branch, subhead 700, to meet the cost of organising the FMM of the APEC in September 2014. The panel, the relevant panel, was consulted on the 4th of November. And in attendance today for the item, we have Ms. Ao King Chi, Permanent Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, Mr. Jackie Liu, PAS of the Bureau, and Mr. Lam Man Wing, Assistant Commissioner of Police. So, Ms. Dari Li, the Financial Services Panel studied the proposal at its meeting on the 4th of November. Members were in general in support of. The organisation of the FMM of APEC in September 2014, and are in general in support of the financial proposals in relation to expenses related to meetings, security, organisation units, hospitality, reception of guests, hospitality, promotion and publicity. Etc. And by way of this opportunity, Hong Kong can display its competency and strength in the status of an international financial centre as well as a tourism capital, and the products related to publicity and promotion will create more business opportunities of Hong Kong. 
and members also support the proposal to disseminate information of information by way of the FMM so that members of the public and students will understand the meeting more. You can queue up for asking questions. For the moment, four members have raised their hands. Uh, five minutes each. Uh, Mr. Wong Kok Hing first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Concerning this FMM, I'm in support of uh, organizing it, but I have a number of worries. The first worry is how Hong Kong can enhance its security measures, in particular to guard against terrorist activities. We should strictly guard against such activities. Can the administration tell us what will be done? Because in the paper it is said that please strains and tasks for are to be enhanced and task force are to be set up. Secondly, my worry is that even though we should organize this event, we should spend what we should spend and save what we should save. Earlier, there were reports that in order to receive these financial ministers or finance ministers, new vehicles have to be used. Is that the case? And is it the plan of the administration to do so? So, is it really spending what needs to be spent and save what needs to be saved? Two questions. Ms. Ao, yes, Ms. Ao. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Wong for supporting this item. There are two aspects here. First of all, security arrangements in organizing the FMM for APEC security is a very important issue because all FMs from other jurisdictions are senior officials. We've uh, gathered experience from previous major events, and the APEC also has certain practices and arrangements that we need to follow. The police will set up a police planning team and there will be an event coordination team and risks will be assessed. In accordance with the prevailing circumstances, the police is confident that it can do its security work well. In conducting the risk assessment, the police will need to work with local um, counterparts as well as uh, overseas counterparts on the use of funding, I agree with Mr. Wong that we should be rational and on the detailed arrangements, uh, it should be on a no-frill basis, but at the same time, um, we should uh, uphold our dignity. As for finance ministers and other um, representatives of uh, international organizations like the World Bank, etc. We need to abide by the APEX requirement and provide them with chauffeurs and transport arrangements. On new cars, we don't have uh, such a practice. We see whether there will be sponsorship or whether we can hire vehicles. Chairman. I think it's important for the administration to have clarified this point. I feel reassured having heard the administration's explanation as it clarifies the allegation that new vehicles must be used. Otherwise, the general public might call the administration's um, fin public finance management into question. I hope that after this clarification, whilst preparing for the event, the administration must do a good gatekeeping job so that you can uh, withstand the challenge of the audit. Next, Mr. Lee Chuck again. Now, I'm, I'm not sure why Mr. Wong is uh, 
concerned about the use of new vehicles. Well, in fact, it's just $60 million. The $60 million, it's a total waste of money. So the Labour Party is against it. There is a big issue with APAC. All along, the Labour Party is concerned about this. All along, APEC only focuses on economics and uh, finance and and uh, and uh, finances, and it has it says nothing about the livelihood issues. In fact, I represent the labor unions in Hong Kong, and together with uh, representatives from. La other labor unions, we advocate the setting up of a nation labor forum. And now under APEC, there is a, a forum for the business sector, but not one for the labor unions. And we have made this request to the um, ministers uh, in the organizing country, but so far, no conclusion has been met. So it's just a business government collusion as far as APAC is concerned. So first of all, I am against it in principle. And secondly, I think this uh, 60 million art is a waste of money because Hong Kong is not the organizing state. The 23 economies under APAC take times to be chairmanship since its establishment in nineteen um, in the 1990s. In 1989, it has been the case states will take turn to chair the meeting, and I don't know the case about Hong Kong. Uh, the ministers in other countries will uh, also wear their um, the uh, cust uh, the um, Traditional costumes and, and photos will be taken. I don't know whether Hong Kong is representing the country or the or Hong Kong itself. And if it's the latter case, Hong Kong should be able to organize an APEC meeting. If that's the case, I think Hong Kong should be able to organize such a meeting. But of course, I am against such a meeting. But my question is whether Hong Kong can be an organizer. But now, on this occasion, China is the organizing is is hosting the meeting, and the FMM, the Finance Minister's meeting, will be held in Hong Kong, whereas the um, organizing state remains to be China, and Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong status, therefore. Uh, is being reduced because Hong Kong uh, should not be just a subsidiary uh, member or an affiliated member. So our status is being reduced, and yet we need to make a commitment of 60 million odd. So is it the case that uh, whilst mainland China is the organizer, we're hosting the meeting, and we are also funding? The event with 60 million odd, and my other question, my first question is whether Hong Kong can organize this APEC meeting, and secondly, whether Hong Kong has become um, Well, first of all, uh, Hong Kong can also host its own APEC meeting, and secondly, whether Hong Kong. Well, um, I don't think that APEC is not relevant to livelihood at all. For example, on how to promote financial. Uh, the financial sector. This may help the SMEs as far as financing is concerned, and also investment among the public, general public, as well as promoting infrastructure and also financing in the region. This can help uh, improve people's livelihood, and therefore it's relevant. We should not ignore the, uh, these points. Chairman, 
she hasn't answered my question. I asked two questions, and she's just beating about the bush. Anything to supplement? Every time for the series of APEC economic leaders meeting, one of the members will assume chairmanship, and in 2014, China will assume the chairmanship of APEC. And as um, chairman, it can select the place for hosting the meeting. And for FMM, it's a very uh, high-ranking meeting, and it's an honor for Hong Kong to be chosen as the place to hold APEC FMM. And it can also have a positive impact on us. Of course, every member can apply um, for chairmanship. So she's answered you. But in gist, she's made it clear that every member can apply for chairmanship of the APEC meeting. However, instead of doing that, we've been asked by the Chinese government to host the FMM meeting. This has reduced our status as an independent economy. She hasn't answered my question. My question is whether a member of APEC can apply to chair the meeting. And if that is the case, we can apply to chair the meeting as well, although I am against it anyway. So I think there is no reason why Hong Kong is not applying for chairmanship, and instead China is assuming chairmanship whilst Hong Kong has to pay from the public office. Why is the case that the Chinese uh, government is not paying for the uh, meeting? Mr. Wong Yuk Man, after 1997, Hong Kong has, the has had the experience of hosting major international uh, meetings. That the last one was in 2005 World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference, and we had the experience, and uh, we still have strong um, or. We had the recollection for um, those uh, protesters; they were not arrested. Whereas for us, we were arrested for illegal assembly or unlawful assembly. So it's um, really unfortunate to be Hong Kongers. In fact, they also committed unlawful assembly. But anyway, in 2005, the conference was held uh, at the uh, Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center. That was the sixth ministerial conference. At that time, a report was made to LegCo on the scale. First of all, there was uh, there should be a hall accommodating four. Thousand participants, a hundred working stations, a hundred media stations and uh, media centers, etc. However, in this paper, nothing is mentioned at all. You're asking for such a huge sum, so can you tell me where it will be held? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Wong, for your question. It's mentioned in the paper. The about the. Now, please tell me next September when, where will it be held? Well, subject to members' funding approval, we will start with detailed arrangements. So you haven't decided on the venues yet, and you're asking for funding. So answer me. No venue arranged. My turn. All right. I still have lots of questions. We are trying to look into different e venues. For example, well, give us examples. But well, let's listen to PS first. For example, the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center. That's a very good choice. But we need to um, wait for funding approval before we start with the detailed arrangements. But this time, the scale will not be um, will be similar to last time. We expect about 500 um, representatives. From, will attend. And my question: Don't beat about the bush. Don't talk about the details. I'm asking where it will be held. Well, less about 300 friend, um, members of the media coming from overseas. So th it will be of a smaller scale comparing to last time. That that's the question I wanted to ask. 
on the hiring of venues and other facilities, we need to see these details so that we can make comparisons. If, say, you ask for a bigger sum for a smaller scale meeting, then that's unreasonable. Last time for the uh, World Trade Organization, altogether the expenditure for guest reception was um, 9 million. Now, you say that this time it's of a smaller scale, and yet you're asking for 16 million for accommodation, guest reception, publicity, promotion. Why is this so? Because last time you had a larger scale meeting, only $9 million uh, was spent, and this time $16 million. And also, there are, um, there are also the uh, giving out of souvenirs and other um, uh, other uh, things, uh, etc. So can you tell us what would be included? Because we didn't have these last time. Thank you, Chairman. Now, on um, hotel accommodation, hospitality, according to the rules set by the um, APAC for ministerial rank and other officials, we need uh, to provide um, a certain sum of money for hotel accommodation and also Dinners, lunches uh, will also be provided for the delegates, as well as cultural performances and social programs. Thirdly, it will be promoted locally as well as overseas. As mentioned by Ms. Lee, at the panel meeting, members gave us some good suggestions. They urged us to take this opportunity to explain to members of the public as well as to ha um, launch publicity overseas, and we reserved funding for this. Chairman, last time it was of a much larger scale, and only $9 million was spent. And now you're asking for $16 million, and you're talking nonsense, so I'm against it. Next, Mr. Yu Si Wing. Thank you, Chairman. The APEC meeting. Uh, being held in Hong Kong will help directly promote Hong Kong's image. So I support this proposal. Now, on uh, in the paper, C is about office equipment, furniture, stationery, etc. Security arrangements, X-ray machines will be purchased, as well as uh, tools and metal detectors, and the, it will cost about $5 million. My question is whether these are brand new equipment and tools and after their use, how will the administration handle them? And alternatively, if um, not, uh, if brand new uh, equipment will not be purchased, and can the facilities be provided uh, internally? Well, first of all, we will uh, through the usual through the established government procurement procedure in. Purchasing office equipment, etc. We have an accreditation mechanism, and the police will also need to install security system. For example, walkthrough machines, and of course, uh, the, we use the uh, established tendering process in procuring such equipment. We don't. Uh, own these equipment yet, so perhaps I'll defer to Mr. Lam from the police to say a few words. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the question. We need to upgrade our equipment, and only when the, the, there is a need for the event will we procure such equipment. C. Office equipment, furniture, etc. I don't think you're going to hire them. Yes, we are. Because furniture, as well as personal computers and other office equipment, if we procure all these facilities, the government may not be able to use, utilize them fully. So we um, will use the service provided by outside companies. On chauffeurs, 
just now you said that limousines will be hired and uh, there should be a designated chauffeur for a limousine. Will now on the monitoring of chauffeurs, they, the chauffeurs may come from different uh, car companies, and there is a need to have proper monitoring on the uh, arrangement and also training for chauffeurs. How will these be dealt with? Yes, I'll say a few words and I'll defer to Mr. Lam to elaborate on it. You're right, because we're either hiring limousines or um, the limousines are sponsored. So apart from chauffeurs and limousines, we also have um, uh, coaches and other shuttle buses for uh, hospitality and we again that they need to we need to accredit it um, uh, they will need to go through accreditation arrangements mr lamb security arrangements um, there is a sensitivity about security so we are not going to disclose too much details it's part of our risk assessment thank you chairman next mr charles mock thank you chairman I support the FMM of APAC being held in Hong Kong. I have some comments as well as some questions. The members already asked questions on the arrangements uh, and on, for example, hotel security arrangements and also risk uh, of uh, terrorist attacks. Of course, these are matters of concern, but on information technology and uh, cyber security, it seems that no member has mentioned this point so far. We have heard recently the Snowden scandal revealing that uh, there have been hacking incidents in major international events, and uh, it's hoped that the, organ um, the organizing country will not take this opportunity to um, allow any hacking incidents to computer systems. So on the use of computers and mobile phones, well, these may become easy targets, and there, there could even be spying activities. So there should be sufficient safeguard, and at the same time, there should be more transparency so that ministers around the world can feel uh, reassured that their equipment will not be hacked. So that's a point for the administration to note. And yesterday, I like uh, I had this experience in CGO, and I'd like to share it with you. Yesterday, we had a meeting in the CGO, about 500 or 600 participants. A lot of um, start-up companies uh, overseas and other um, VCs uh, had a meeting. It was organized by CDB, and uh, there an, an app was uh, invented for uh, insta for uh, voting on the spot. However, the system went down as soon as voting started. So you cannot rely on existing um, IT infrastructure in allowing several hundred people to use. The net at the same time, things cannot just be resolved by money. You need to upgrade the infrastructure and provide more facilities on Wi-Fi. And uh, uh, I, I hope that you will um, pay attention to this. You haven't answered where it will be held, but I guess in Hong Kong it's either the um, HKCC or AWE, which could provide larger venues. And I can say that definitely this will become um, uh, uh, this will turn us into a joke in the international community. So please take note of this point: fourteen million dollars on IT. I can't uh, ca calculate on your behalf on your behalf whether this sum will be sufficient. Anything to supplement? Thank you, Mr. Charles, uh, Charles Mock, for your questions. Yes, uh, in terms of security arrangement and risk assessment. Information security is an important aspect. We have existing legislation to deal with cyber security and information security and any unauthorized acts. 
And in cracking down on cybercrime, the police has spared no effort. It has the expertise, it has the capacity to deal with that. In relation to the arrangement with the FMM, when we have um, selected a venue, we will invest enough resources on the cyber infrastructure. We'll make sure that uh, the technical hiccups mentioned would not happen. I think we do have some experience in uh, this sort of matters. Thank you, Member, for your reminder. Ms. Dari Lee. Mr. Chairman, the DAB supports the organizing of the FMM in Hong Kong. We believe um, by organizing the FMM, it will help to boost Hong Kong's international image because during the meeting, cities uh, with representatives of the meeting would all focus their attention on Hong Kong. Um, but of course, as uh, some members pointed out, we should spend money wisely. The government is now proposing um, commitment of uh, $63.45 million. Well, we support uh, the funding proposal, but what internal audit and control do you have? Because just now in response to members' question, you haven't even firmed up the venue. From the accounting point of view, we support uh, the funding application, but we're worried uh, when uh, if you have secured the funds, you just spend it uh, regardless. Now, we believe there should be reasonable arrangement and we have to make sure that we stage a, the meeting properly and in line with the um, status of the finance ministers, but we must not be extravagant. So what sort of internal audit and control mechanism have you set up? How can you assure members that uh, you'll make sure you uh, will uh, meet no more than the required standards of um, reception? Prime Secretary, well, here we're talking about public money. When we use public money, of course, we must go by the relevant uh, governed regulations, especially when it comes to procurement. There are standards to meet. And then, of course, we should only spend uh, where spending is due. We agree. And how do we do it? We have to make reference to the uh, standards adopted in previous APEC meetings. We mustn't do any less than that. And there is a steering committee within the government chaired by the um, Secretary for the for financial services in the Treasury. As I said, we will go by the um, spending criteria of the government and the APEC standards. Of course, uh, we won't spend where spending is not due. Ms. Darily, while we had a discussion at the Economic Development Panel, we hope that um, we will let more people, especially students, know more about the um, influence the APEC has in the region. So we may need to mobilize volunteers and participation by others. So how do you plan to do that? How are you going to form your volunteers' teams? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have some um, preliminary ideas through some activities. We could um, involve the students and local organizations. What about design competitions, school competitions? We're considering that. As for volunteers, Inside and outside of the venue, there may be tasks that could be taken up by volunteers. What about um, hospitality or reception? Maybe volunteers could help too. So these are all um, ideas on our agenda. Next, Mr. Mr. Tommy Jung. Mr. Chairman, the Liberal Party supports this funding application. We believe it's good that there is this opportunity. It's hard to come by. Therefore, we must seize upon the opportunity. But my question is uh, on the cost for security arrangements. Paragraph 12, it says it doesn't include the staff cost for time limited civil service post for the event coordination team and the police planning team. And um, there, the security arrangements, um, the budget is $5 million for procurement of uh, some servers and hire of security personnel. Now, in similar events in the past, is it the case that uh, police officers are not allowed to go on leave? They have to go on standby. Uh, to, they have to stay on standby. So, such costs are they absorbed by the police force under his own head of expenditure? Or is it the case that some uh, provisions should be given to the police uh, to pay for overtime work? 
Permanent Secretary. Perhaps I could invite Mr. Lamb to um, also give some information. It's true. Uh, security costs mostly involve accreditation system, the uh, hire of a security service from security companies, and so on. But then under the police force, we'll set up an eight-member police planning team is responsible for planning. And nearer the time of the uh, event, uh, we may make other manpower deployment and some police officers may need to help. On how we uh, um, use our resources, uh, perhaps Mr. Lem could supplement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, the police uh, will use our internal resources. We've um, hosted various international conferences. There are different arrangements for different conferences, but it's all about flexible re uh, internal deployment of resources. Thank you. Well, yes, in some cases there could be in, uh, flexible deployment of resources. But here we have this um, police planning team. It's uh, said that uh, its task is to make plans, and these are time-limited civil service posts. But why can't you include the uh, budget here? Now, every now and then we may host an, a major event, but then um, that may add pressure to the police force. I don't think it's fair to them. You can imagine how much manpower resources the police would have to devote to this event. So should you consider giving them some provisions? Permanent Secretary? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Member, for your concern. Now, uh, I think the eight-member police planning team is sufficient to deal with planning matters. As for uh, flexible deployment of police resources, that's always been the arrangement. And then when we invite uh, tendering, uh, or when we've done the tendering, of course, there will be security companies helping us. There will be a, um, over 90 security guards um, um, who will help the police with the security um, control. Next, uh, Dr. Kenneth Long. Mr. Chairman, I support the APAC meeting, but uh, for this paper provided by the administration, I'm rather disappointed with it. Mr. Chairman, you're a banker. If you look at a budget like this, $63.45 million, and there are just a few items. There are no assumptions given for the budget. Um, you know, I'm not comfortable reading this. The way you present it, you should put the figures in front. For items A to G, they should be put at the back. It will be easy for us to follow. So in future, when you prepare documents, you have to consider um, making the paper more reader-friendly. And then for items A to G, you've given some brief description, but I would also like uh, more figures. For example, item A, $9.5 million. How do you arrive at that? I would like to see the uh, information. And um, for comparison purpose, the 2003 WTO ministerial meeting. Perhaps uh, you could do some comparison with the meeting, say, for a meeting of a similar type. Um, for each item, the cost was so much. That would serve as the basis for us in approving your application. Now, this paper, I think, is really poorly prepared. Still, I have uh, two or three questions. Mr. Yu Wing. Asked among, out of the sixty odd million dollars, is there any money for uh, devices or uh, equipment and so on? But really, I'd like to ask: uh, out of the sixty odd million dollars, would there be any capital asset or acquisition of capital asset? Um, can you first answer that question, Permanent Secretary? Where we could hire, we would hire. So there will still be some capital asset if you are unable to hire some equipment. For such capital asset, what would happen to it? Usually, how would you dispose of the capital asset? Well, at the moment, I couldn't think of any uh, capital asset that uh, we will keep. So we will try to hire as far as possible, unless in the market, uh, there's this case that certain equipment could not be, uh, it's not up for hire. For example, um, just now Mr. Lam mentioned uh, security, um, some devices, they may not uh, be up for hire, or maybe for security reasons, the police wouldn't want to hire such equipment. Rather, they want to procure such equipment. But of course, if this equipment is procured, it could be used for similar activities in future. 
No, perhaps uh, the department uh, is planning to buy certain devices. You could take this opportunity to, to buy the devices and then um, transfer it to, uh, to the revenue department uh, with depreciation afterwards. Next, uh, Dr. Kenneth Lang still. Well, with transportation arrangement, I'm really against it. Uh, you find a venue, your VVIP say stay at Grand Hyatt, and then your venue is next door, that is the uh, Convention Exhibition Center. If that's the case, I really don't see why you need um, uh, several dozens of limousines. It's ju is it just because you need to meet the protocol? Even if it's a uh, distance of 100 meters, you have to drive the VIPs to the, to the next destination, even if it's only 100 meters away. Have you considered a greener arrangement? Even at the um, financial affairs panel meeting, I also raised this point. And um, on what Mr. Starley said about internal audit and control. Now, after the the event, uh, would the uh, director of audit uh, perform an audit, and would the audit report be submitted here? When would the report be available? Thank you, Prime Secretary. Would there be any auditing arrange procedures on transport arrangement? Let me explain. Dr. Kenneth Leung is right that uh, for the APEC protocol, for finance ministers, they have limousines from one point to another. Uh, there's need to use limousines for security reasons, probably. And then there are some delegations uh, staying further away at cheaper hotels. Then we have to provide shuttle buses to them, so to take them from the hotel to the uh, meeting venue. And also there's need to transport um, uh, Materials and so on, so we need um, to high to use uh, goods vehicles. So transport arrangement is in is in unavoidable. Now, of course, uh, if uh, this funding application is approved, we are talking about spending public money, and the audit or, or control of spending of public money is the same as uh, that for the spending of any other items of public money. Now, do you have a special audit report for this item? No, uh, we don't have such a plan, but of course it's up to the director of audit to decide which uh, item it will look at. He, he, they, uh, he will look at. So it's up to the director of audit then. Next, uh, Dr. Fernando Jung. Now the APEC has 21 members, 21 economies as members. China and Hong Kong are both economies represented at APEC. In other words. In the APEC, China and Hong Kong are equal members. Next year, China will be chairing the APEC meeting. But for the finance minister's meeting, Hong Kong is chosen to host the meeting. So it's, it's like China hosting the event, but Hong Kong picking up the tab. Now, for this uh, decision, uh, to host the FM in Hong Kong. Uh, who initiated it? Did Hong Kong ask to host the meeting or did the Central People's <coughs> Government appoint Hong Kong to host the meeting? <coughs> Prime Secretary, thank you, Mr. Chairman. From another point of view, Hong Kong has the opportunity to take part in this event. Hong Kong has the chance to benefit from it. Can I get a direct answer from the official, please? I'm not say, asking whether Hong Kong will benefit from it. I'm asking <coughs> for this Finance Minister's meeting to be organized by Hong Kong. This decision, was it because Hong Kong government asked for the opportunity or was it a task um, appointed to Hong Kong by the Central People's Government? Prime Secretary? Now, at the Bali FMM, the uh, state leader made a formal announcement that Hong Kong was chosen as the place for hosting the finance minister's meeting. That's an honor for Hong Kong. Can the official answer the question, did the Hong Kong government ever ask to organize the finance minister's meeting? Have you ever made effort to or make the request? Yes or no? I've already answered the question. Well, she's answered the question, but whether you could hear the, uh, follow the answer or not uh, is uh, your is really a matter for you. But I didn't hear it. Is it um, uh, you didn't hear her answer? That means that's the, that's the answer is no. So you mean this was a um, assigned to Hong Kong? If that's the case, I think the Central People's Government should uh, take up the uh, financial commitment.
the Hong Kong SL government. If we try to support the uh, CPG, that's another matter. But in terms of uh, financial commitment, I don't see how um, we should uh, pick up the cost um, as we try consider this uh, funding application on behalf of the people of Hong Kong. Do you have anything to add? Well, Hong Kong is taking part. Hong Kong will benefit. Of course, Hong Kong will also make contribution to the country as the country is the chairman of this meeting. Next, uh, Mr. Christopher Jung before is uh, Mr. Li Chiao Yan's turn. Mr. Christopher Jung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the APEC summit meeting. Everybody wanted to, to host it, and we all know if um, a place hosts such meeting, it will boost the international standing of the place. It will also enhance uh, cooperation in the region uh, with the region. Now, CBG has secured the chairmanship of the meeting, and uh, CBG asked Hong Kong to host the FMM because it's taking care of the Hong Kong SAR. It's hoped that Hong Kong then then play, can then play a um, stronger role as a bridge. So we should thank the CPG. It's not like some members said uh, the uh, CPG is hosting the event and we're picking up the tab. No, that's all I want to say. It's not the case. Mr. Secretary, anything to add uh, to respond to? No, nothing really. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Second round, three minutes. Mr. Li Chang Yan. As the Permanent Secretary said, uh, Hong Kong people will benefit. But then you can see we have to cough up $63.45 million. I don't see what benefits we'll get from it. Now, if the finance ministers come to Hong Kong, um, it, it's our glory, our status will be boosted. You know, after the WTO, I don't see how our status was enhanced in any way. And if you really want um, to have this glory, why don't we formally apply to chair the entire APEC meeting? Why must we let the CPG assign us or force the FMM upon us? I think this has all to do with the status of Hong Kong. In the history of APEC, can I ask you this? Was there ever the case that as a country or uh, an economy as a member chairing APEC meetings and then another member Another economy as a member uh, organizing the F finance minister meeting. I don't think it's ever happened. <coughs> if that's the case, perhaps uh, with this whole arrangement, we are uh, belittling the status of Hong Kong. So what you're doing is to belittle the status of Hong Kong instead of uh, formally applying to chair the APEC meeting as a member of APEC. And I don't agree uh, to what's been said uh, that uh, the livelihood issues involved. If you care so much about people's livelihood, financial development has an impact on people's livelihood. And financial development is such that uh, it's distorted the development in uh, the arena of people's livelihood. Some other industries could not uh, be developed. Uh, or promoted, but you've never consulted workers or labor unions. That's why I've always said APEC has no regard to people's livelihood issues because APEC never consults its uh, members, um, labor unions. We've been uh, striving for that for years, but they don't care. They just care about the views of the business sector, not uh, of the workers. So how can we uh, believe that uh, APEC is also about people's livelihood? Permanent Secretary, all along, We've been emphasizing one point. The hosting of this FMM of APAC is indeed an honor for Hong Kong. Hong Kong is not just an international financial center. Hong Kong is also a MICE hub. We all know that tourism benefits employment to a very great extent. And in the tourism industry, we've created a lot of jobs. And more than one member of APAC has hosted more than one FMM in the past. Mr. Tam Yeo Chong, Mr. Chairman, I do not understand the thoughts of our colleagues. $63 million for an FMM, and they think that that's expensive. 
In fact, even if we have applied for hosting the event, we might not have got it. Many jurisdictions would like to host such events because such events will help publicize and promote the jurisdictions concerned because all the media throughout the whole world will be arriving in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, we'd like to publicize our status as a business hub and an international financial center. We would like to absorb or attract more tourists to Hong Kong. So immediate and long-term benefits will result. And then we have to adhere to the protocol and standards set by APAC. We must not let them down because in the past many cities have already hosted such events. So we would like Hong Kong to be praised for good organization of such events in terms of transport, hospitality, etc., etc. So I do not agree with our colleagues. We must attach huge importance to this event. Just now, colleagues' remarks were very displeasing to the ear. Why should there be an event, event in Hong Kong in the 2008 Olympics? Because Hong Kong would like to have an opportunity to publicize itself in the international arena in the international community. So we would like to display our strengths and abilities in such events. Of course, we should guard against any mistake in organizing such an event. I don't want to see a report in future which points to various errors and mistakes. One more member for the first round and two more for a second round. I'll draw a line there because I don't think there'll be any more new questions. So we can take a vote after the three members have spoken. Mr. Sin Chong Kai, Mr. Chairman, the Democratic Party supports this funding application. Of course, we would like the administration to strictly control costs for all the items. In fact, if Hong Kong can organize more international conferences and in different aspects in terms of economy, financial services, culture, etc., if we can have international participation, it's good. Therefore, we would like to strive for more room for international participation. So we support the funding proposal herein. Next, Mr. Yu Si Wing, second round, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the last financial year, $150 million were used to set up a mega event fund. That is to boost tourism and economy. So $63 million is not a huge sum is a hard-earned opportunity. The whole world will focus its attention on Hong Kong. I think we should put it in the reverse way. It is worthwhile. So I support the government's funding proposal. Next, Mr. Tommy Chang, second round. Very quick, Mr. Chairman. I heard colleagues say that our country forced this upon us. Well, I think they're trying to benefit us. Why should we putting it in the reverse way? It is very displeasing to the ear to hear that the country is forcing this on us. All right, if there's no more question, I'll put this item to the vote. That is easy, 2013-14-6 to the vote. You claim a division. All right, the division bell will ring for five minutes.
冰块。而家講緊表決，因為佢而家有兩份都仲係亞太嘅，有翻會議嘅，有翻會議。啊，講聲係係得五分鐘嘅。冰塊全部，即係平時嘅 motion 唔會同一個咧，就發曬喺依個兩份文件度。唔係，誒響鐘都有點點。嗰、那個發言啫，嗰、那個、那個表決嘅嘢。如果你去填埋一個 motion， 跟住嗰個 amendment， 但係你依個都好似嘢，唔係文件，所以唔會一個都同一個Well, let me remind you, we're now taking a vote on enclosure 2013-14-6 in relation to additional officers. All right, voting begins.
Before I announce the voting results, members, please check your votes. Display voting results. 44 present, 35 for, 8 against, no abstention. I think the proposal is endorsed. Now, We'll take a vote on the proposal in FCR 2013-1436. With those in favor of the proposal in paper FCR 2013-1436, please raise their hands. All right. We'll have a division. The division bell will ring for five minutes. Yes.
Please be reminded that we're talking about the new commitment, the document on new commitment. Voting begins. Voting begins. Before I announce the voting results, please check your votes, members. Display the voting results. 44 present, 34 for, 9 against, no abstention. The voting result is that the proposal in the paper is endorsed. We proceed to item 3 on the agenda. Paper FCR 2013 On the 15th of uh, November, the Finance Committee did not complete its discussion on a certain item. That is uh, to approve enhancements to four existing types of excretion allowances for clearies. and an extension of applicability of the excretion allowance for permitted occupiers of licensed domestic structures and surveyed domestic squatters affected by clearance to eligible clearies who opt for the excretion allowance in lieu of rehousing to public housing units. In attendance for this item, we have the Deputy Secretary for Development, Mr. Thomas Chan, the Principal Assistant Secretary for Development, Mr. Lokin Wai, the Director of Lands, Ms. Bernadette Lin, and the Assistant Director of Lands, Mr. Law Hin Wing. Last time, many colleagues have asked uh, quite many questions. I hope they will not repeat their questions. Next, Mr. Tam Yu Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I didn't ask this question last time. I'd like to see if, in this case, the applicant is eligible. If on the government land he has got a license to run a workshop, let's say a um, woodwork uh, workshop, and because of government projects, say because of uh, the need to construct a road there, they're asked to move. So under such circumstances, according to this paper, will he be eligible for uh, EGA? Now, Chairman, for licensed shop operators on government land, before 1982, these licenses were issued. After 1982, no such licenses were issued. But if, according to the member's knowledge, as he said just now, there is a workshop, then under such circumstances, prima facie, he meets the eligibility criteria. But, of course, we need to checked if the license was issued before 1982 or whether uh, it's re related to this category of licenses. Definitely, the license was not issued in 1982. It moved once because on the last occasion, on government's request, the workshop was relocated to this area, but now, again, because of government projects, it has been asked to move. So I, un um, I believe the license was not issued in 1982 because it had been asked to move once. But according to the spirit of the paper, they should be allowed to legally run a woodwork factory there. And my understanding is uh, whether um, and then my question is whether the um, EGA should be given to the, the applicant. Now, for, there might be transfer of license, but if the license originated from one issued before 1982, that is if there is relevance, then according to the enhancement, uh, proposed in the paper today, this will be the approach. But we need to establish the link first. And I think after this paper is approved, the uh, approved criteria will be used in vetting that application. I still have some time left. So if at, um, if the license didn't originate from one issued in 1982, then 
Well, director emphasized just now that it must be one originated from uh, 1982 license. Does it mean that it will not be eligible? Director, I believe so. So, is it unfair to the to uh, him because I see that uh, the uh, criteria has been relaxed? Not just those in 1984, 1985, and now because of capital works projects, they have been asked to move. They didn't move on their own initiative, and they will suffer loss if they move. So, have you factored this in in your policy formulation? Would you need to uh, further consider it, Director, Chairman? This is a specific case. I don't know the details of the case yet, but generally speaking, for licenses uh, to run a, com a business taking on the government land, after 1982, no such licenses have been issued unless the license is related to one issued before 1982. For com um, commercial activities on government land, usually it's done by way of STT, short-term tenancies now, which is a more modernized uh, um, land uh, use permission document in which there is stipulation that on government's notice, uh, it will have to move, and uh, against this backdrop, no EJ will be given. Yes, it's um, it's run under the STT with the government, and at that time, there was no period stipulated, and um, the government, on one year's notice, could ask the operator to move without compensation. But now that this policy is going to change, should this um, so these kind of uh, undertakings be uh, able to benefit from it. Will you exercise discretion, Director, for this case, Chairman? Well, we need to follow the mechanism. If we don't have um, any discretion uh, on the matter, then we can't exercise discretion. For other cases, for example, in Northeast New Territories, when we communicated with um, the community, we also received such requests from shop owners or shop operators, and we're going to uh, consider this suggestion in the future reviews. Then please review your policy. And, um, as the case I mentioned, no compensation will be given. So, Director, when you review the the policy, you should review the situation. Next, Mr. Albert Chen. Chairman, I think we need to clarify the scope. Now, in the paper, possibly two um, types of shop tenants might be affected. The first type is those on government land or private land. For squatter huts, um, built or registered in 1982, that's in a frozen state. And now, an uh, extra ship allowance will be given to them. The second type is um, licensed plots under short term tenancies. When the license is issued, the government stipulates that with three months' notice, the government could revoke the license and the occupier will not be eligible for any compensation. And that's the established arrangement for such licensees. Now, in your paper, For those running a business there, they should be given EGAs, shouldn't they? Director, Mr. Chen mentioned the two types of structures. One is squatters or domestic squatters registered in 1982. If it's for domestic purpose or domestic structures, then in the paper, we have proposed amendments to extend the applicability of the EGAs and to enhance the payment. 
as for domestic structures or squatters that have been registered. Domestic removal allowance can be given to existing occupiers, provided that the conditions are met. Mr. Chen's example just now uh, is on business operators running um, inside licensed domestic structure, uh, licensed structures, and it's different from um, short-term tenancies. For short-term tenancies, for example, we have car parks um, at the moment, and with three months' notice, they can they um, will have to move. For licensed structures, we're talking about uh, those licenses issued in 1982 or before. So I'd like to clarify: Are we talking about the affected structures registered in 1982? And not the licensed plots or licensed squatters, and not the um, operators operating on such plots. In short, this paper is about squatters affected by clearance and those registered in 1982, because there are different types and it's confusing. Director, simply put, Chairman. This paper doesn't cover short-term tenancies, but we can't say that only squatters bef uh, registered before 1982 are covered, because there are quarters, uh, squatters um, having a similar status as these uh, nine squatters registered in 1982. But we are talking about not talking about um, uh, short-term tenancies. That's for sure. So in your paper. Licensed structures are also covered. Director, I think it's clearer if we look at footnote one in enclosure one. On the applicability of uh, EGAs, what do they cover? There is a clearer description on the scope. The license structures, many of them are not registered as domestic squatters. At the time, um, many such structures were licensed at the time of registration, but not registered as domestic squatters. So the compensation for this type should be completely different. Take the example of Chao Yun Village. Director, I think Mr. Chen and myself are both talking about old, um, older license structures. In agricultural lots, sometimes we see uh, licensed um, government licenses for some purposes and such. Licensed huts or structures if it's used for domestic purposes will be eligible under the uh, proposal in the paper. However, for older licensed structures, there are different types, and I'd like to refer members to footnote one of enclosure one for details. Mr. Li Chen again. A question for the administration. It seems that they have all the say in para 9, para 10 of the paper. This will be the date when it, when it will take effect from the 15th of July. And because of the OALA, that, um, I mean, um, during the OALA exercise, the administration said that no, that could be. Um, the, the the effective date could not be pushed forward, but now why is it that there is a retrospective effect for this one? Well, not that I'm against this proposal. I just feel that the administration is being inconsistent. Sometimes they stand firm, 
um, using the pretext of dis fiscal discipline, etc., that no, there should be no retrospective effect. But now, why is it uh, that now it is possible, but not um, for OALA? Somebody from FSTB? Last time for the old age living allowance, we're talking about a new policy. We needed to consider uh, which financial year was re uh, involved and the deployment of financial resources uh, and the re re recurrent expenditure. And uh, this time, uh, it's different. We need to consider uh, each case on its own merits. So we're all still in the haze. Definitely, this is double standard. We're not against having retrospective effects. I just want to state that in the future, when we ask for retrospective um, effects, don't use the excuses such as fiscal discipline. Any more questions? Yes? Please clarify licenses in Enclosure 2. I just want to make it sure. Enclosure 2, licensed, does it mean structures built on licensed land? That is, squatters are not built on licensed plots are not covered in Enclosure 2, is that right? Director, here, licensed structures means the examples I've just cited. That is, the landowner is permitted to erect structures on the plot. That's what is called licensed structures. That's the approach. Uh, we adopted uh, in the early 80s or before 1982 in that we allowed people to uh, erect structures. Then the administration needs to be careful. For many years, no licenses will be given to hillside squatters. The government only tolerated such squatters. The government didn't issue licenses. They were only uh, registered or uh, marked in red or yellow. So my understanding for licensed structures is that for those plots used for agricultural purposes and that um, uh, rent at a very low rate was offered, that's for the structures were erected for domestic purpose. And squatters registered in 1982, 1982 should not be regarded as licensed structures. Now it's, it says nothing about hillside. It's uh, something to do with uh, agricultural land and private agricultural land. Director, please allow me to explain. Mr. Chen and I were talking about two different types of structures, but both can receive uh, EGAs on, in, our pay, uh, in our paper. One is licensed structures. The other is the, um, uh, 90, the uh, squatters uh, registered in 1980, surveyed in 1982. Both are eligible for EGAs. OK, so I think he, he uh, has understood. For some surveyed in 1982, 10% were built on licensed plot, but the, nine, the remaining 19% were not. And for the EGAs mentioned in your paper, they covered um, the first type as well as the second one. Then that means not just licensed structures will be covered, because the heading of your paper is licensed. An error with the document or what? Enclosure 2. It clearly states that licensed domestic structures affected by the clearance. That that's the EGA for permitted occupiers for licensed licensed domestic structures. Chairman, all along, 
we are talking about licensed domestic structures. That's the um, squatted uh, survey in 1982, and for other licensed structures, as mentioned by Albert. Chen, um, that's uh, red uh, license structures erected on agricultural land. So these are two different types. So it sh it must be for domestic purpose, right? So this point has been clarified. If there are no more questions, I put this item to a vote. Those in favor of FCR t bracket twenty thirteen fourteen thirty three, please raise your hands. But those against, please. Raise your hands. I think the majority of members who have voted are in favour of this proposal. It's now five o'clock, so we will have a ten-minute break and resume at five ten for the three remaining items. I want to thank the member for his contribution. The time has passed. 追诉期嗰个，而家要讲咩？我想讲一讲个个有效期个追诉期嗰嗰嗰一点。可以可以，诶、呃，你简单讲讲。吓，其实系通过咗今日开始起，先至生效嗰啲新嘅新嘅诶诶赔偿嘅安排。讲紧倒转头计嗰个日子咧，系边啲？嗱 ，this is about um， 诶、uh, ，the calculation is about who is eligible。Uh, so in uh, the disbursement of the EGA, it uh, comes in effect today after the paper is endorsed today. So this has nothing to do with the old age living. Uh, it's the same as the old age living allowance. So it comes in effect today upon approval. You mean for these people, the the EGA comes in the new EGA comes into effect? You no no after approve um, that is on that day. Uh, but you know. The the EGA, and you know, if I say something happens, you have to pay EGA on a certain day. Uh, this rate today applied, uh, approved today will apply, right? No, when we talk about the new calculation for the EGA, it only comes into effect today after approval has been granted. But as to who would be eligible for this EGA raise, there will be various kinds of calculation. So it's not the case that it, there is retrospective effect. So it's not the same as retrospective. So we'll take a break of ten minutes. We'll come back at five, uh, ten.